Hi, I'm Isaac. Uh, I am one of the members of the GMOD's uh, sort of exec team, and I want to welcome you to our September meeting. Uh, how many, for how many people is this the first meeting of GMOD's they've been to? All right, so decent number. Welcome. Uh, so basically what we are is the Northwestern Synthetic Biology Club, and we meet every month and we talk about news, and sort of specific topics in synthetic biology. So like generally we do like a newsreel, highlights from the month, and then we go into like one or two in-depth lectures. Um, we're also interested in doing other uh, sort of interesting things uh, in, with the synthetic biology community if anyone wants to help out with that uh, and get some extra manpower. So in terms of who we are, um, there are four of us on the exec board. Um, it's Sarah Stainbrook from Keith Tiles Lab, Joan Muldoon from Leonard McGeary Lab, and Weston Keitlinger from Jewett Lab, and me, I'm from Merkin Lab. Uh, could you guys like raise your hand so everyone knows who you are? Yeah, that's, that's the exact word. Um, and so we've got a listserv, probably most of you are on it already. We've got a blog, uh, most of the stuff uh, on the blog also goes out to the listserv. We've got a Twitter, various things. We're funded through Northwestern Center for Synthetic Biology. So, uh, welcome. And today we're going to be hearing from uh, two new synthetic biology professors, Julius Lux and Daniel Tolmersik. They're going to tell us about the kinds of science that they like. Um, but first, we're going to tell you about sort of things that happened this month. Um, and uh, for those of you who are wondering like where I got all this new stuff, uh, I wrote two blog posts about how you get synthetic biology news. Um, and so if you're interested in those, you can go to the blog and learn how to be like me. <laughs> um, so my favorite blog post from us, uh, this starting off with a blog post, so your blog post is blog There's like a gmods blog, gmods blog, gmods.wordpress.com. So uh, my favorite blog post from the past month was uh, this post on the Plus Synthetic Biology Community, which is a great uh, sort of community for writing about synthetic biology. Um, and it was by Dominic Berry, who's actually a, a sociolo sociologist of scientists. Uh, and so he wrote sort of, uh, historical perspective on how the synthetic biology community has grown up and how the term synthetic biology has evolved. And I really liked it not just because it was a, a good piece, but it also it led me to the uh, program that Donna Ferry is a part of, which is the Engineering Life uh, Initiative out of the Science, Technology, and Innovation Studies at the University of Edinburgh. It's actually this large scale study of uh, sort of the synthetic biology community in Great Britain you know, that sort of goes along with Great Britain's push to become like a leader in the synthetic biology world. Uh, and this is just a, a thing from the, and they have a blog, uh, blog uh, called Engineering Life, where they post about the synthetic biology community and uh, problems and, and sure challenges it faces. And this is uh, an image from one of, it, uh, one of their posts, and I won't tell you what it's about. You should go and find it. Um, sequencing. Sequencing is cool, and sequencing in space is even cooler. Um, so some of you uh, who were here in July uh, know that I mentioned that NASA was preparing to launch its first ever DNA sequencer, the ISS. It was an Oxford nanopore minion sequencer the size of your hand. Uh, and so now uh, they've uh, completed the first DNA sequencing ever on the ISS. And this is the astronaut, Dr. Kate Rubens, who led the uh, study. And as of September, they've reached a billion base pairs sequenced in space. And they're using it to characterize the microbiome of the ISS. Um, uh, Silicon Valley got even more money for synthetic biology. Uh, so the NSF gave uh, the University of uh, California, San Francisco, a $24 million grant to build a blue sky bioengineering center directed by Wendell Lim, Wallace Marshall, and Zeb Gartner. They're doing a bunch of things, trying to make cells behave more like computers um, and assemble uh, sort of rationally and do things uh, that we would like them to do. Um, in terms, it was really a big month for biosecurity. There were a lot of stories related to this. Um, starting off, it turns out that Floridians really like genetically modified mosquitoes, at least when you ask them about Zika. So uh, there, was a, a there was a sort of survey that went out uh, asking people in Florida if they would like uh, to use sterile, genetically engineered sterile mosquitoes like the ones that Oxitec uh, produces uh, to combat the Zika epidemic. And overwhelmingly, like the majority of them said yes, they would like that. Um, and so that's a much better response to than like South Carolina's response to the Zika epidemic, which was to wantonly spray pesticides and kill millions of bees, even though uh, there's been no recorded cases of Zika in South Carolina yet. Um, gene drives are starting to be looked at for uh, conservation. So how many people here don't know what a gene drive is? Okay, just a few. So basically, it's a way of using gene editing and hijacking cells, uh, uh, DNA repair machinery, in order to force 
a parent to pass on traits to all of their offspring and causing a trait to sort of spread through an entire population over generations. And so there's a scientist at um, the University of Hawaii um, who is really, really pushing to save these endangered Hawaiian uh, bird species that are being devastated by avian malaria um, and to save them by uh, Number one, trying the sterile mosquito approach to decrease the mosquito population. But number two, maybe use a gene drive, since Hawaii is so isolated and it would be a good place to test it. Use a gene drive to try to reduce the mosquito population and uh, save some of these birds like this tiny creeper. Um, and this has led to a, a debate at the International Union for the Conservation of Natural Species, or something like that, some, some acronym. And actually, Kevin Esfeld, who's the guy who invented the CRISPR gene drive, has pushed back uh, at this convention and said, no one should be trying this just yet. We don't know enough. Um, and, it's, and so he wants to wait until we can sort of develop safer methods of gene drives that are more controllable. Um, DARPA is also worried about gene drives. Um, so this uh, month, they announced a uh, sort of uh, broad agency announcement, of a call for proposals to make gene editing safer. Um, and they want to sort of a fun project that would uh, develop gene editing technologies that have lower off target effects and less chance of like, uh, environmental escape or unintended consequences. They want to fund things that, uh, uh, projects that develop ways to inhibit gene editing and prevent things from being edited, and projects to reverse gene editing. Um, so that's interesting. There are maybe some people here who might want to do that. Uh, the NIH is also interested in biosecurity. Uh, they announced a uh, $20 million prize competition um, to develop uh, rapid ways of detecting and distinguishing antibiotic-resistant bacteria, figuring out is someone infected with an antibiotic-resistant bacteria and what antibiotics are they resistant to in a quick enough way that you can immediately sort of start treating them with, uh, either start treating them with the antibiotics that the bacteria aren't resistant to, or know whether or not the antibiotics would be useful and then sort of reduce general antibiotic use so that uh, sort of resistance spreads more slowly. Um, uh, and the White House has actually updated, uh, announced a major update to biotech regulations. Uh, this is the first major update to the framework of the, the way that biotech is regulated uh, in our country since 1992. And so there are a lot of interesting things there. Um, Cell-free biosynthesis is now part of the framework. Um, and there's been some uh, modifications to plant stuff. So this is a potential future GMOS presentation for someone who is uh, interested in going through the 60-page thing and then telling us all about it. <laughs> um, and in industry news, uh, there was something of an anticlimax, but in a good way. Um, some of you, a few of you who were at like the second meeting might, have, uh, might remember that Illumina sued Oxford Nanopore. So Illumina, DNA sequencing giant, sues Oxford Nanopore, DNA, DNA sequencing startup, alleging that uh, Oxford Nanopore's uh, protein nanopore that it actually uses to read the DNA um, is covered under a patent that Illumina licensed from the University of Washington. Um, however, uh, back in, uh, at the end of August, Illumina and Oxford Nanopore settled their patent, and it was sort of, it happened without very much fanfare. And the reason is that back in March, Oxford Nanopore announced that it was releasing a new pore that was not covered under the patent and actually performed better, and so uh, Oxford Nanopore sort of sidestepped the whole problem and came out on top, which is a a good thing for anyone who gets sequencing because Illumina uh, owns 90% of the market and monopolies are never good for the consumer. Um, uh, so uh, in other industry news, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, the sort of biosynthesis company, that the, the microorganism company, um, announced a partnership with uh, Arthur something, uh, Arthur Daniels Midland, which is this giant uh, food processing company. Um, and they're gonna make some undisclosed natural product for the, for the food company that they'll use in food processing. Um, the thing that Ar Arthur Daniels Midland is most known for is corn syrup. So, not, not super great, but you know. <laughs> um, and to get even frank and foodier, uh, Monsanto has licensed CRISPR technology to modify crops. But with a key <coughs> restriction, and I think this is the first time this has happened, Monsanto got a license from the Broad Institute, but they're not allowed to use CRISPR to make gene drives. And that was specifically uh, stated in the license. So that was uh, a very interesting thing. Now moving on to the actual research papers um, in sort of biomolecule engineering. This used to be a protein engineering, but now we've got lots left, so it's going to be biomolecule engineering. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first off, uh, there's this lab, uh, I think it was led by this uh, Ensemble lab, 
Um, they developed this sort of rationally designed DNA origami pore that can insert itself into membranes, um, and it actually looks like the way they designed it, and they were able to use this pore to uh, sort of push DNA from one, mem uh, from one sort of cell compartment to another, or, or liposome compartment to another. So maybe this is what Oxford nanopore will be using in 20 years. I don't know. Um, Baker Lab, the sort of rationally designed protein kings, um, or rulers, uh, came out with another thing. Uh, this time, they genetically they figured out how to incorporate disulfide bonds into their rationally designed peptides, and um, they encoded a variety of sort of topologies of these uh, sort of short peptides. The reason they want to do these is because these actually look like venom peptides, the, the peptides that sort of snakes and scorpions produce that are very potent pharmaceuticals. Um, and they were also able to do things that nature can't do, like they added sort of D amino acids into their little peptides, and they were also make, able to make cyclic peptides, and even a peptide that had one helix made of L amino acids and one helix made of D amino acids. And they all pretty much fit uh, the way that the, uh, they predicted the structure. <laughs> that they, NMR showed that uh, sort of uh, the structure that the peptides actually had matched what they had designed. Um, and also they're incredibly stable, like, uh, they remain stable at 95 degrees Celsius in water and at like 6 molar guanidine chloride. So, fairly standard Baker lab pair. Um, in genetic circuit news, uh, a lab, uh, I think it's led by this, this guy Chang, um, developed this sort of uh, circuit that's got a, a two layer system and it basically is a, a way of replacing inducible production of protein. Um, so, in this circuit, your, your cells, they grow, and once they reach a certain density, this switch turns on, um, and then it's sort of like, okay, now I need to start transcribing the molecules, uh, transcribing the things that will start making precursors of my desired product. And then once those precursors build up, the second switch will turn on and actually start converting them into your desired product. Um, and sort of with this whole, uh, the reason they do this is because it's, you get much higher densities of um, bacteria much faster, and then once you have the high densities, you can start switching to producing lots of things. Um, and so you can see here, this is the nutrient sensor. Once the cells get high density, then you start making a lot of protein from the promoter. Um, and as a result of all this, you can make a lot more vanillic acid than, or maybe a, a, a significant amount more than you can using sort of uh, normal inducible uh, production. Um, as always, there was CRISPR. There actually wasn't a lot of CRISPR news this, uh, this month. Uh, but there was one thing. So uh, this lab, uh, Bhatia lab, uh, developed this sort of photocleavable inhibitor of guide RNAs. So basically, this is a, a little inhibitor. It binds to the guide RNA. Um, and as long as it's bound, the guide RNA can't uh, uh, enable the Cas9 to do DNA cleavage. Um, however, when you shine blue light on it, it cleaves these little uh, linkers and then it splits into a bunch of sort of smaller fragments, and those smaller fragments fall off, and you can actually do gene editing. And so you can see here that in the absence of light, nothing gets cleaved. With light, you get cleavage, and it works in cells. So nice little work there. Um, uh, this is a little. This is from a little uh, further back, but uh, the fifth annual synthetic yeast genome of uh, meeting happened, and some highlights from it. Um, the synthetic yeast genome is 60% integrated into yeast, so they're making a lot, a lot of progress uh, sort of engineering an entirely new genome for yeast. Uh, our own Josh Leonard gave a talk, and that's always cool. And there was a continued controversy uh, about surrounding the human genome project right. So the project to synthesize a human genome is quite controversial. And one of the leaders of the project, Jeff Bokey, gave a talk about it. And then there was a panel immediately afterwards where like, a couple of panels were like, I just want to stay. I don't support this project. <laughs> so, um, in autotroph synthetic biology, I thought that was really cool. Um, this lab was actually able to make photosynthesis a little more efficient. So it turns out that photosynthesis is limit, limited by Rubisco, the sort of carbon dioxide incorporating enzyme. And it's so slow that you wind up with like a ton of extra reducing power from the uh, light-driven reactions that just sort of gets wasted. And so this lab added in this cytochrome, or, or this P450 enzyme, that can take some of that extra reducing power and convert it into desired molecules. Um, and so, and the, because it's sort of like otherwise wasted energy, um, these new organisms show the exact same growth rate as the wild type, and they are able to produce a bunch of this uh, sort of fluorescent small molecule product uh, that's catalyzed. So, oh, and, and it also shows the photosynthetic energy conversion 
of the engineered ones is actually higher than the wild type. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Um, fine, that's a, and then in therapeutic, uh, uh, sort of potentially therapeutic synthetic biology applications, um, James Collins' lab, uh, he's like really well known for doing uh, cell-free systems that have been freeze-dried and put on paper so they're really hardy. So he did that, um, and he developed a way of making like a bunch of different things uh, with it. So you basically take cells, you pop them, you freeze-dry them, uh, and then you take your uh, plasmids of choice, and you freeze-dry those, and suddenly they're super stable for years, and you can take them out into the field, and then when you want to make a desired biomolecular product, you just add water to both of them, and you can make whatever you want. And so he showed that you can make antimicrobial peptides, so this is, these are the kind of antimicrobial peptides that you end up purifying, and they actually work, they kill the bacillus bacillus, and they also kill E. coli. Um, you can make antigens that you could potentially use to uh, turn into a vaccine, um, and so he was able to show that the antigens that you're able to produce with this, um, when you inject them into mice, they provoke, uh, they, get, they lead to uh, antibody production, uh, which is specific to whatever the, the antigen was. <coughs> Dip theory in this case. And you're able to do other things like make a bunch of different small molecules. And the nice thing about this is that uh, you can basically mix and match your freeze-dried plasmids, and so you can make whatever small molecule you want depending on the pathway. So you, like, you just add in this one, you get this molecule, you add in these two, you get a different molecule, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's a really sort of powerful and flexible system, and it's very stable. And so you can use it in places that don't have lots of freezers and uh, expensive equipment. Um, and finally, the, uh, I'm sure some of you saw this, but uh, uh, Dan Gibson's team at Synthetic Genomics has debuted Vibrio Nutriagents as a replacement for E. coli uh, because it grows like twice, maybe three times faster. It's got a doubling time under 10 minutes. Um, and so you can see after six hours, you get colonies of Vibrio Nutriagents. And so the idea here is, and they also made like uh, uh, plasmids that you can use in Vibrio Nutriagents to do like inducible uh, production of protein. So they're able to make a ton of uh, GFC. And the goal here is to like reduce the entire cloning cycle to a single day and make things happen much faster. Um, so that was very cool. And there's a lot more that I didn't get to uh, because you know I don't want to take up these guys' time. Uh, but that'll be on the newsreel that I send out on the listserv and on the blog. So thanks for listening. <laughs>